<laughs> Ronnie and Reggie Cray, the twins who became the undisputed bosses of East End Gangland. Were they born villains, or did fate shape them for the role? A lot of people s stole things because they were hungry. They had no other means to, uh, to live. I know people say, oh, we other people got out the East End and um, they made it. It's not like that for everybody. I mean, some people are more brainy than others. Um, they have more chances. And in your life, you mean to go one way and you're pulled another. It's not the individual fault all the time. The craze had got something about them that was almost indefinable. To say that they were personalities is wrong because they projected an aura of evil, of power. They would resort to violence at the slightest provocation to establish a reputation. And this they did very, very successfully. So that not only foreigners and people that intruded in the, into the East End, but members of their own gang respected them because of that violence. But if the Crays were so evil, why did the community in which they lived put up with them for so long? In London's poorer quarters, the line between right and wrong had long been blurred. Many of life's simple pleasures were outlawed by the state. Late night drinking, card and dice games, and off course betting. I mean, I lived in a place called South Grove Buildings. Well, it was a big old block of flats. There was at least three bookmakers in there used to take the bets. And uh, they all got a living. And all of a sudden they might say uh, to my dad, Barney, my dad, you know, Barney, I've got to nick you today. So it would be his turn to get nicked. He'd take him to court. Uh, illegal bookmaking, street bookmaking, might get found f a fiver. The East End contained many illegal drinking and gambling clubs, which were frequently targeted by the police. People were in there playing cards, and then the police was raided. They take them to the police station, they have to appear in court next morning, get fined 10 shillings, five, whatever it was in them days. And that's where the people thought, what, what are we doing wrong? All we're doing is playing cards. We're not doing anything wrong and they're arresting us, and so they lost their respect for them. Down the East End, the police were sort of natural enemies in some extent, and people didn't come running in with information unless it was to their benefit. Because there was so little respect for the law itself, many East Enders were unwilling to call on the police to investigate even serious crimes. They're a community of their own. They've lived hard, they've had a hard time, but it was their ethics and a code of honour that um, you didn't normally grasp. But this code of honour exposed the community to exploitation by professional criminals who turned it to their own advantage. In the East End, the law that was enforced was often the law of the Cray twins, Ronnie and Reggie. The twins ran that part of London like an iron rod. There was nothing that went on in that East End that they didn't know about. If there was a wrongdoing, get off the manor, because they would come down on you like a ton of bricks. Well, you know they keep saying about protection, they was running the protection racket. It wasn't actually <coughs> like it sounds. You would go, they would go into a place and say, if you don't give me a, we look after you, if you don't pay this, you'll be in trouble and all that. People actually used to go to them and want them to look after it and let, let it be known that they was looking after a place. They wasn't... <coughs> actually, I suppose it is a protection racket in a way, but it, it was worked on a different basis. People used to go to them and ask them to look after them. There were lots of people that walking into pubs, pubs that were taking a lot of money in those days. Remember, we were talking about the early 60s when live music and good entertainment was uh, throughout the East End, throughout every part of London. And protection money was being asked for. And therefore, rather than pay three, four, five, ten bullies, um, it's better to go and ask Ronnie and Reggie Cray, could you just appear for ten minutes or have one or two drinks in our pub on a Saturday night? Once it was known as a pub that the Crays used, then that publican didn't have any more trouble. They only went into people that were breaking the law. You know, like if you had a publican who was having a laugh to timer, then they could go into him. Or if they had a club where they were doing illegal gambling, dice, spieling or something like that, they would go into them. They want their wet. But no way could they ever go into straight people. Because the first, if they come into you, the first thing you do is pick the phone up. 
give me the police. And that was it. So the only people they could intimidate were people they couldn't phone the police. To take the heat off their activities as criminal overlords, the Crays maintained an elaborate facade of public relations. They, they were very conscious of the public image. They were. They, they worked a lot on it. And so what they would do is hire or, or use one of their own clubs and let it be known that they were organising a, a charity night. They didn't put their hands in their pockets and say, oh, look at this, I'm shocked about the, uh, the children's unit has got no scanner or whatever. Uh, I'm going to put this money in. No. They would get other people to give it to them. Then they would hand it over uh, in front of the, the cameras and whatever and take the glory from it. News of these up-and-coming charitable sportsmen was by now hitting Fleet Street. But to some crime reporters, the story didn't quite add up. Norman Lucas of the Sunday Mirror sought to win the Cray's confidence in search of the truth. He found the twins at their club, the Double R. There was a constant flow of villains in and out. And uh, they would stand at the other end of the bar and there would be whispered conversations. And then Reggie would say, well, oh, wait a minute. And he'd detach himself and go along the other end of the bar and have whispered conversations with these various people. It was then that I began to get my first suspicions that the, the craze weren't what... Uh, they were pretending to be very, very honest chaps who were working for charities. Norman Lucas nursed his suspicions about the craze, but many patrons of the Double R saw nothing in the twins' conduct to disturb them. Uh, Ronnie and Reggie were always the customer side of the bar with the customers. They were just socialising the whole time. You were never aware of any business going on whatsoever. They were just in the company all the time. As we always said, if you want to be treated like a lady, you'd be speaking to a villain. I've, I, I mean, I've been invited to lots of Chelsea parties with Hooray Henrys. I've heard language that I would never, ever hear um, in the East End when I was out with Ronnie and Reggie Cray, God, there'd be one look from his eyes if anyone dared to swear in front of his mother or his aunt or myself or any other lady in his presence. Say they used to come to the Astor. You could feel, you could feel a certain atmosphere. The Cray twins had arrived. That was the atmosphere that, that people got. I don't think it was fear. It was just, I suppose it, well... I suppose if the Queen was to walk in, every time I said, look, is the Queen there? there, there, there would, something, a feeling would arise. This royal progress might have continued unchecked, but for Ronnie's recurring bouts of mental instability. In 1958, he was committed to a mental hospital after attacking a man with a bayonet. Reggie Cray invited Norman Lucas to accompany him on a visit. Reggie went in to this uh, mental hospital and uh, I thought Reggie came out and we drove off in a bit of a hurry. I must say, I mean, I was being driven. I wasn't, I was in their car. And um, so I turned round to Reggie like an idiot and said, uh, uh, well, um, how was Ronnie? And uh, he said, well, I'm bloody Ronnie. He said, Reggie's in there now. And I thought, Jesus, what have I got myself into? I, I said, uh, but, but, but you, you, you mean you're, you're, you're now an escaper? And he said, ah, oh, well, I'm not really, am I? He said, they, they shouldn't have put me in there in the first place. I'm perfectly sane. Why should they do that? And um, I, 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 I thought, well, what, now where the hell does this put me? I mean, I'm, I'm just a newspaper man. The switch pulled off. Reggie walked free. But Ronnie was now a fugitive and Lucas perhaps an accomplice. With Reggie at his elbow, Lucas called on contacts at the Home Office to negotiate a surrender deal for Ronnie with no penalties attached. And I came off the phone and Reggie said, 
I wouldn't have bloody believed it if I hadn't been standing in the phone box. He said, what's he saying, this man in the home office? I said, well, you heard. I said, if Ronnie will give himself up now, with it all, tomorrow morning, he will go back there, but he won't necessarily stay there. And, uh, they said, well, that's bloody marvellous. He said, how is it you know such high-powered people at the home office? Said, all part of the job, Brett, all part of the job. The job Lucas was really doing was penetrating the Kray's empire in order to expose them. It wasn't easy, but following Ronnie's release, the police were having even less success. It was always difficult to try to mount an action against the Kray's uh, if you worked in the East End. I mean, the story always was that whenever there was a serious crime in the East End, it was down to the Kray's. On two occasions, I was approached by individuals, one of whom had a small club, the other had a small business making perfume for these suitcase sellers in Oxford Street, both of whom were threatened by the crazed to pay their rent, as they called it, and um, if they didn't, they got beaten up. And in fact, the chappy with the poor perfume, he, he got his place burnt down. And the answer is yes, they got there by fear and the lack of evidence. In July 1964, Scotland Yard set up a special squad to investigate the craze rackets. But even after Nipper Reed had taken the twins into custody, key witnesses mysteriously withdrew their evidence, including one woman who had begged him to free her from the craze. When we said that we were taking these people away, they were going to be arrested, she fell down on her knees and grasped my legs in our arms and said, thank God, thank God, you've saved my life. And I said, we'll come later and take a statement from you, thinking that the next day would suffice. But the next day, of course, as, as happened in those days, we'd arrested the craze at one o'clock in the morning. We, they were charged and they appeared at court the next day. The, on that day, when they appeared at Old Street Magistrates Court, this lady, now resplendent in furs and high-heeled shoes, was there, all very nicely dressed, and saying, uh, Mr. Reed, I'd like to stand bail for my good friends, the Cray twins. And so Reed's first bid to jail the Crays collapsed. With Ronnie and Reggie back on the streets, they seemed invincible. But crime reporter Norman Lucas had hit on a sensational story. Lord Boothby, a leading member of the House of Lords, had been caught up in a homosexual relationship with Ronnie Cray. I thought, well, this has gone far enough, and now I think I should write an expose news story. I knew that once I'd done that, I was finished, as far as the Crays were concerned, but it, it was a story which, in my view, needed to be published, uh, and... Uh, and everybody needed to be made aware of, of what they really were so that no more titled people or um, prominent show business people should be uh, caught up in their web. The problem was the sexual revelation at the heart of the story. The newspaper was delighted with the scoop and wanted to run it. Lucas himself was not so sure. I said, well, we can't. We, we can run the story about their association with a peer, but we must not use the word homosexual because who are we going to call if Booth be sues? Who can we call to prove this? We'll be sued for libel. But Lucas was overruled. The newspaper's lawyer, Philip Levy, worked out a formula to protect the mirror from a libel action. And uh, Levy said, well, as long as you just say uh, that Yard are probing a homosexual relationship between Ronald Cray and a peer, uh, you will be safe. And, uh, but don't mention Lord Boothby's name. The allegation was inserted into Lucas's story. The Mirror went ahead and published. 
But then, of course, the, the, the walls came tumbling down on the Monday because Boothby did the most cunning thing in the world. He wrote a letter to the Times saying, uh, everybody says this is me. And on that basis, he sued us and uh, got £46,000 damages, which, as I learned just 48 hours later after he got the money, he was forced to hand over to the craze who blackmailed him and said, well, if you don't, we will say this is a true story. Now the Cray twins seemed untouchable, but the old demons of paranoia returned to haunt Ronnie. The slightest squeak of opposition was enough to trigger the most extreme of responses. One man with no respect was George Cornell, who had publicly ridiculed Ronnie for his sexual preferences. People said to him, George, you know, you want to be careful. You're, you're going over the top. You keep it. Ronnie won't stand for this if you go. You know what he is? He's a nutter. That's how people say. He won't stand for this. And he carried on and carried on. Ronnie uh, even said to me, I don't know what he thinks he is. Hey, Cornell, you better not go too far with me. In 1966, Cornell drove into the heart of Cray territory to take a very public drink in the Blind Beggar pub with his South London friend, Albie Woods. We walked in the pub, we walked to the end of the bar. George plunked himself right in the corner. We were back to a, a petition. And by the side of George, there were some curtains which led into the public bar. And this was at 10 past eight in the evening. There were a number of other people in the pub, 32 people altogether, in fact. And, and the barmaid was behind the bar and so on. It was the normal kind of evening in a pub of that kind when suddenly the door burst open and Ronnie Cray walked in with another man. I think someone has stopped a couple of feet before they've reached me and about a step backwards, like, you know, near enough behind me. I looked back at George. Oh, I looked, I didn't... I, I noticed there was a gun pointing at George. I looked back at George quick. George was really snoring at him, sneering at him. Ronnie drew from his pocket a Luger uh, uh, automatic gun and, and just pointed it at Cornell's head and shot him straight through the forehead. Well, it was absolutely terrible. You, you can imagine being there and there's people firing guns like in your direction. All I've got is a stool, you know, in front of me. And, you know, what for, I don't know. The stool wasn't going to do any good. You, you don't think of nothing. You know, all I was thinking of was any second light is going to be me. Within minutes, the bar was empty. People were gone. The, the people that were with Cornell had left. George was moaning and sort of groaning like, you know. Anyway, I stood up. There was nothing I could do. I knew the ambulance was on its way and I didn't want to get involved. And I walked out of the pub. There was really no motive. It, it was just a question of Ronnie trying to assert himself as a gang leader to show that he was like the Americans, that he'd got his button, as they say, that he'd killed his man. He wanted to show his gang that he was really the colonel. He wanted the public to know that he was a gang leader. And so it was with this in mind that he was able to walk into the blind beggars with 32 other people inside, with no attempt to disguise himself, confident because of his ab ability as a gang leader that he could walk in there and know that no one would give evidence against him. Charlie Cray was unaware of the shooting. A few hours later, he was summoned to meet Ronnie. He said, what's the matter? He said, oh, I've, I've just shot Cornell. So I said, oh, what are you? Now, what, in a pub? You've gone in a pub and shot someone in a pub? Oh, I said, oh, do me a favour, Ron. You know what happened now. You'll, they'll have you by tomorrow. Don't worry about that. Ronnie eluded the police. But it wasn't long before they caught up with Albie Woods. They said, right, now we want you to name who killed George Cornell. I said, I don't know who killed George Cornell. I said, I never saw their face. I said, it happened so quickly. I said, and, you know, just that they were standing behind me. I said, the, the shot, you know, went right across my face into George. Oh, and when we tried to get witnesses, people said they didn't see anything. They didn't hear anything. You know, it's as, as if the thing had never happened. 
Uh, the barmaid said she was downstairs. She was in the cellars trying to get some more drinks up and things of that kind. And so that there was this desperate situation where suddenly this, this dramatic event had taken place and nobody had seen anything. But they kept trying and kept putting plenty of pressure on and, you know, but uh, with all the pressure and all what I was offered, you know, or no way could they win with me. I'd sooner be in, inside for the rest of my life than, you know, grasp people up. When I think about the Cornell case and all the problems, that was the really the beginning of the worst problems I was ever going to have. When I knew what happened when they told me, I thought, I was just sick inside, you know, and uh, I thought then that this is the beginning of the end. Still no one dared to give evidence against Ronnie, but any chance he might have had of getting away with the murder of George Cornell was smashed the night his brother Reggie killed Jack McVitie with a carving knife. As Charlie Cray told his twin brothers, We could have had a fabulous life before these murders. We had it made and we could have gone to better things. And as I said, you two would have been somebody. You was fate in life. And I said, now I think it's gone. You've blown it. Everything, you know. Our mother, father, me, you. We're going to go. I know we are. And everything's finished. In 1969, the Cray twins were convicted of two murders. Charlie Cray was sentenced to 10 years for being an accessory to murder. But in the East End, there were mixed feelings about the verdicts. When the twins finally got nicked and they got, they got found guilty and what happened to them, I was very, very upset, very upset, because even though people think they was uh, murderers, villains, gangsters, I mean, there's a lot of people done a lot worse than them, got a lot less for it, and still getting less for it. And in a lot of people's eyes, they'll still go as two nice boys, even though it's might strange strands to, to you, they will be known, still be known as two nice boys. I mean, the whole of the East End was devastated. I don't think they ever dreamed, nobody in the East End thought that they'd be sentenced to 30 years, minimum sentence. Uh, I think it's a very, very long time. Um, I think if they did what they did, they deserved to have to spend a lot of time here, definitely. You must pay, definitely. But it seems a long time now. Things have changed now. Um, they're old men now. And my opinion is they've paid now. I think it was 25 years in March, last March, and I think, yes, they've paid their price. But one of the architects of their downfall has no such sympathy. I, I didn't consider them to be friends as such. Uh, okay, I, 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 I enjoy having a drink with anybody and I enjoy listening to anybody's stories of this or that. I felt that at the end of the day, it, it was, I was going to get a first class story out of it, possibly a book, a feature series, and do a public service in exposing them. It was about using them and conning them as much as I could. But I wouldn't like them to know where I live now in case they get out. Because of our live and exclusive coverage of the Arsenal against Torino match at 7.25 next Tuesday, gangsters can be seen at the later time of 9.30. Back to tonight now and the bill is next with an all too obvious murder suspect for D.I. Johnson. And over on 4, The Long Summer. <laughs>